finally, I have managed to get my partner, Adrian Jones, to agree for me to take control of the podcast for once. How does that feel, Adrian? Delighted. Are you sure? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. You're not shivering in your timbers, are you? Oh, not at all. No, I can't wait. Are you sure about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm fine. (laughs) Because next week I've got Q&A for you, so, yeah. Oh, aren't I just lucky? I'm very, very lucky, aren't I? You're very lucky. We're both lucky. Yes. So what are you going to ask me all about? Well, Adrian, I'm not going to ask you about your hobbies. Most certainly not. (laughs) Today is not the day for, 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 for chatting about hobbies and what you do in your free time. I know... And a lot of the clients that we work with, what you are very, very good at as an agent. We know that one of the areas you shine in is the buying agent role. Now, why would you think that the clients would say that you are one of the best buying agents they've ever worked with? Great question. Um, Isn't it just? Well, it's a that's what you get when you get a great podcast host. Um, I just think the whole buying agent thing, it's quite interesting. I think some of the reasons why I've had compliments is people have never come across it before. And why do you think that is? It's still quite an alien concept out of central London. So if you ask most people who understand what vaguely what a buying agent is, they immediately think of high net worth individual abroad, um, who doesn't have the time or indeed the location to get somebody to buy a property for them. And we both know a number of agents. You've done it before in London. Um, we've got a number of Keller Williams colleagues in London who look very specifically after mm-hmm. that market. Mm-hmm. Um, high net worth and one, one uh, colleague, Natalia, super high net worth individuals where she will literally spend half a year finding you know, a super prime property. So... We've obviously, you know, we are working in some very, very lovely parts of, of, of England, but it is a completely different market, and I think, and it's relatively unheard of. So, w- why would you say it's different? I think the main thing is that's different is partly the value, mm-hmm. partly the client. We're dealing with successful, what I'd call real people. You know, well, people what are real people to they've, you? They've still got jobs they've still got mortgages okay they still have a car um they don't get driven they don't you know they're not multinational so they're they're successful people time is precious which is why they value um somebody helping them to buy Mm -hmm. they respect um uh, another professional who does a professional job for them with your expertise they may be an expert in something else but they acknowledge the fact that although they're bright people this is what we do for a living Mm -hmm. So we can provide that expertise. So why do you think they would need an individual like you? And the reason I'm asking that is because everybody knows there's there's a thing called right move, supla, on the market, etc. Why would they pick up the phone, phone you, Adrian Jones, to have that meeting to discuss the property they desperately are looking for? When does that happen? And why do you think that happens? Combination of things, lots of different points behind it and we'll try and remember and think of all of them as we go but it, it obviously the right move and zooper is a shop window for you know probably 95 98 percent of properties that are ever sold and it's fair to say that somebody will eventually see most properties on one or, or indeed all of those portals but there's we can still help somebody buy the ones that are on that portal. Somebody likened it to being um, a shopping, a buying assistant. Is it shopper? A personal shopper. Personal shopper. You may have Selfridges or Harrods full of blouses, jackets, trousers, but it's your personal shopper who actually. Uh, cuts down a thousand options into 10. Oh, I see. So what you're saying is you, 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 so you take the option, cut it down to 10, um, because what they are looking for, exactly what they need and looking for is not what they can find on the, on the market sector, so to speak, on, on your, your online platforms. Is that well, correct? No, they, they, using my analogy I've not thought of before, all of these pairs of jeans 
may be available on the rack in Selfridges, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but your personal shopper will grab the 10 that obviously fit. Mm-hmm. That's a bit of an obvious thing. It's a bit like saying, well, it needs to be four bedrooms, Not no point putting a one-bedroom apartment in front of you. But also, we think it suits you in terms of your age, your style, and what you're really looking for. And the analogy between clothing and housing, it, you can't keep running that analogy, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. The, the principle of it is the same. Somebody who's time precious and has got all of these things to look at. It's a bit like maybe a, a travel agent with a holiday. You go and search holiday in Spain for two weeks in, in February and look at the mass, yep. massive yep. things you'll get. You need somebody who actually defines it. And it's, it's, a, it's the same sort of logic. And that's for the things that are visible and available mm-hmm. online and that they see online. Uh, we've recently done uh, a buying agent for somebody who found their property online or see, saw a number online. We still helped them look at them, say, don't waste your time, wrong area. Uh, or encourage them to see other things that they didn't like when they saw them online because we know other things about them. And were these clients local or were they living abroad? This particular client was a client abroad coming back, an mm-hmm. English couple in Bermuda mm-hmm. coming back to the UK. We've now found them another property which was off market. Um, but, you know, we were looking at things that were on the market. They'd send me links. What about this? What about that? And I'd say, you won't like that. It's not for you. Mm. Um, I just know that that's right because I know what you're looking for. And I'd send them things that they'd missed because I thought you don't realise that this house has potential to extend or it's brilliant for the schools mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, But these are the things that are visible. Um, perhaps the main role of, of a good buying agent is knowing the other things that are not available, that are coming, that may be becoming available, or indeed you go and find them for them. So how would you facilitate that role? You've, you've got a property as a scenario. There is a property you see, they are not on the market. You don't know if they want to sell, you taking a chance. Do you send a letter through their door or do you actually knock on their door? H- how would you handle that? It's a property, it's, it's a dream property for the couple. It's exactly what they're looking for. It's in, within their budget, within the area they want to be. And you've seen this property and you just think, I need to get that property nailed down for my client. Yeah. What do you do? How do you go about that? So if you rewind um, with the, the couple that you're looking for, say a couple typically is, mm-hmm. you have a really, really good discussion with them, usually face-to-face, but it can be online, it can be a combination of two or three meetings and really get an idea of what they're looking for. And then in addition to helping them look at what they can see and what's available, uh, there's two or three things that we can do. We know, as a, as a relatively small business, we know there's 14 properties that we've got that are coming available in the first quarter of next year. They're not online. They're on our, they're on our books. We've got mm-hmm. terms. They will be released in the new year. Chance of one of those 14 being the right one is slim, but every other agent will have a similar pipeline of possible or confirmed instructions for the, for the future. So that's the first thing you do. You contact other agents and say, this is the requirement. Have you got anything coming up? Let's say they don't have anything coming up and you've got to go knock on Mr. Smith's door, let's say. Yep. How would you handle that? How would you approach that? Because that's quite a... A lot of people will actually frown down on that, wouldn't they? And think, well, who are you and, and what gives you the right to actually come to my home, knock on my door and ask me if I'm thinking about selling? I mean, what do you think about that analogy? First approach wouldn't be a door knock. What the, first appro- the first approach would be uh, anybody out there has probably had letters through their door from an agent saying... Many letters. Uh, uh, to be honest, most of them are uh, not real, unfortunately. So we write a letter which I think every single one we put through a door, people know that it's, it's a real had a purpose, letter. yeah. Um, and we write it with the client. Mm-hmm. So we reveal some elements of their personal search and their story, which makes people realize this is very real yeah um but we obviously don't disclose you know too too much personal information but we we show that it's a clearly an interest we indicate to because what we do with this we search uh, we've got some pretty sophisticated software uh, i don't like the word software but it's the only thing to use it's a very quick mm-hmm. database of every single property that exists yeah so you put in their key criteria you then narrow it down or expand it depending on the result you get if you put in their criteria and get 10 properties that exist, you think you need to expand your criteria. Yeah. Likewise, if you get a thousand, you need to narrow it. And then we write to those people saying, 
we have this client, we've, they've asked us to find them a property, mm -hmm. and we've identified yours at face value as something they could be interested in. Would you please let me know what your thoughts are? And please, you know, please make contact with us. We get a, a, a comparatively high response to that. It's still only 5 or 10%, mm -hmm. but that is a huge response to what is otherwise a cold letter. But it's written in a very warm way, and we we apologise right at the beginning for, um, you know, what could otherwise be seen as something obtrusive. The question the clients ask me is, why would somebody wait for this letter, however well crafted, yes, yes. however thick the paper, mm. however lovely the envelope? Why would they wait for that letter? To say, oh, thank you know, thank heaven the letters come through my door. I can now sell my house. It's because people don't wake up on a Wednesday morning. Mm -hmm. or a Sunday morning and say I'm going to sell my house they've been thinking of it for days, weeks months, often years and we're big believers in buyer competition exposing your property to the full mm -hmm. in its best condition possible quite a lot of people don't necessarily want to go through that and if you get the letter at the right time hit your doormat and you open it up and say do you know what I think I might give Adrian a call so Here's a question for you. Just going to muddle things up a little bit more for you. Ooh. So I'm your client, Mrs. Smith, let's say, and I am incredibly fussy. You've found four properties for me to have a look at, which you feel would, would suit me down to the T. You show me these properties on paper and I turn around and say to you, but that's not good enough. Where do you get the additional willpower strength from to continue because it is it's it's a tough job mm. and i remember back in the day when i used to do it you are running around 24 7 until you find that property and it's it's really tough it's incredibly tough depends on someone's time frame and in a way it's no different to a purchase that somebody was making without a buying agent it's a matter of compromise and if you Using, using the example of, just say that they said, we want to be in fleet. We want a four-bedroom detached house, which has got at least a quarter of an acre of garden, and we're willing to spend one and a half million. Just say that those are the core criteria. Uh, and we draw the map of fleet that they are happy to live in, and we've discussed the roses. So I don't want to be there, but I will be there. If you then have written to every single one of those properties, well, they've looked at every one, and those who've replied and those that are on the market, none of them really suit them. Mm -hmm. The question then is they need to change their own criteria because I'm very happy and you as you are very happy to help people as much as you can. But if they're looking for something that they are not going to like and not going to accept and not going to look at, they need to change their criteria. Mm -hmm. whatever, the, whatever the element b may be that they don't like. And it might be you need to stop looking in fleet. If you think that road's too busy, it's too much of an estate or whatever it may be. So we might need to think of somewhere else. But also be patient in finding it. But that comes back to their time frame. Yes, absolutely. So I'm one of those clients, let's say. What, fussy? Very, very fussy. <laughs> it's in my nature to be fussy. <laughs> well, I work with you, so Take what that can I compliment. say? It's a compliment, it's a compliment. I want to be on a quiet road. I've got two cats or two dogs, but the cats are my main concern. Don't want them knocked over by a car. Don't want any of that. I want to be close to, to, to land where I can walk my animals, the dogs, where I'm not going to have a lot of people knocking on my door trying to sell me things. We've looked all over fleets, let's say, and there's nothing available for what I'm looking for. Where would you say is the next best place to look at? Now, keeping in mind, being within walking distance to a rail station is not something I need. That then immediately suggests some of the villages on the outskirts. Which would be? Um, well, what so would your top it, one be? Depends on some of your other criteria about proximity of shops and pubs and socialisation. Well, so I... Because that I, then exactly. immediately points to Hartley Whitney... 
Odium. Mm-hmm. You're then looking at some of the what I'd call the the beautiful quiet villages, mm-hmm. where unfortunately quite a lot of the local amenities have, have gone apart from. Maybe I don't the mind park. getting in my car, driving to the shop. I so you're then looking at walking to a shop. You're then looking at Dogmersfield, Winchfield, Rotherwick. See, the Cromwell. worst thing is is what I feel is that as a woman, for me, if I need to go and buy groceries, I go to the big Tesco at the Meadows. I do my you know, two week shop and that's it. I can't stand having to walk into a shop, walk up to the shops and go and get something I need for this evening. I'd much rather get in my car and go and do it because I know myself, I'm going to walk out of two big grocery bags and I certainly don't want to walk home with it. It's not just shops. I think it, it, that comes back to, you know, the sociability thing. Do you want to be able to just walk to a pub, a restaurant, uh, other mm-hmm. things? It's not just necessarily the, the shop because of course a lot of people have it delivered now. Yeah. <clears throat> a lot of people yeah. shop on the way home. A lot of um, them do, that's right. Somebody who bought a house from us uh, last year in Winchfield, which was a little bit cut off, um, they were saying, I'm struggling to um, find something closer to Hartley Whitney. And they then realised both of them drove in their jobs. And quite often, instead of going out to, to food mm. shop, they'd phone each other on the way home and said, who's going to nip to the shops? And they'd do it on the way home. So they didn't need to be a mile away from... And as you said, I think it depends sure. on how sociable you are. Are you looking to live in a community where the community is the heart of the village and there's always something happening, like Hartley Whitney, for example? Yeah. Or do you want to have the quiet life where your social circle is very, very small and you keep your friends on your one hand, so five friends, let's say, uh, max? It really does depend. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love community. I'm a strong believer of having a, a strong community but I don't have children and I think for families who have children looking for their home which will suit them but also be perhaps their forever home is one of the most difficult things to find so them calling you Adrian Jones is a good idea I'll, because give, you, 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 I'll give you a very live example of that that I've actually got a very live case where I think from the buying side of things, we've enabled somebody to buy the, the, a better house than the couple from Bermuda coming to buy. Their initial thoughts were they'd buy something very remote with quite a bit of land and not be able to see too many people. And it's not because they're antisocial, they're lovely sociable people, but they've actually lived somewhere where 180 degrees of their mm. visual from where they live is water. So the idea of living in a more typical street scene was difficult Mm -hmm. so they were initially looking half an acre acre uh village track down the side road of a village and really away from a lot of it they've eventually bought in the heart of hartley whitney because they realized two children school age very sporting they are very sociable as a couple Mm -hmm. they will love that village you know that i'm very Uh, partial to Hartley Whitney but it's not about the fact they bought in Hartley Whitney it's about the fact they bought in more of a community in a village with um, a a, a sociability about it and again it's not just the shops that that village could have been one with not a lot of facilities but would have still had houses and people and movement and activity and I think that's what uh, in fact I know they said one of the best things we did wasn't finding them the house but it was actually correcting what they were going to look at. And the one they nearly bought before that was also right in the village as well, but they chose this one. Okay. So basically the most important thing to remember for, for listeners out there is if you are looking for a house and you cannot find exactly what you're looking for and you just do not have the time to keep looking, this is when you need to phone someone like Adrian. And and that's because you'll end up saving a lot of time he will bring you a portfolio of properties that, that could be available to you and therefore you'll be able to move into your dream home much quicker than you can imagine. I think there's one massive thing that is the difference. Um, and what's that? As the buying agent, we are acting for you as the buyer. Now, 99% of sales in this country we are acting for the vendor, our vendor, our client, who pays our fee, and we are doing a job for them. I think everybody who's ever bought a place through us as a buyer 
will be very happy about the fact we were open and transparent and straightforward and honest and fair. But we ultimately are negotiating for our owner and our client. So if we're negotiating on price, I'm not doing it for the buyer. I'm doing it for our owner and our client because that's part of the job that we're supposed to do. So so it's a very personalised service, but they end up wanting to refer you because the service you render is, is not just professional, but you, you're very accommodating and friendly individual but it does help. also flip the whole scenario around mm -hmm. suddenly i'm acting for you as the buyer yeah or we're acting for them as the buyer we are then negotiating on their part we are looking after their interests yeah. so if we are showing a property on behalf of a vendor we will be telling people about the great pros of this property we will be countering the things that aren't quite so good about it and trying to say oh well yes but the moment you're acting for that buying agent, for that buyer, you will actually say to them, right, the things I like about this house are boom, boom, boom. The things you need to consider that aren't so good are boom, boom, boom. You'd never do that mm. with a buyer acting for your vendor. And that's the complete flip side. Mm. Suddenly you've got somebody in your corner who is providing you professional advice as to whether you should buy this house or not. Mm. Uh, we as acting for a vendor will be saying to the buyer in fairness we'll be putting a positive spin on that house because it's what we do and, that, and, and don't just think of it as us every other agent selling a house for a client will be trying to sell that house to you we're acting for you to buy that house and we're going to tell you about it warts and all these are the good things mm -hmm. these are the bad things mm -hmm. well i think it all boils down to and we've spoken about this before adrian time is very precious and any any um individual using you as a buying agent or you know you're needing to sell a, a vendor's property they do not want their time wasted time is very precious you can't buy that back so they are putting their trust and faith in you how do you feel about that uh it can be a pressure mm -hmm. and obviously even a normal scenario of acting for a vendor and you perhaps encourage somebody to look at something that they might have been half-hearted about and they look at it and they don't like it you think oh, I hope I didn't waste your time I think as a good agent you are very rarely wasting somebody's time you've had a good reason why they you think they should look at it I think one of the things with the buying agent role is you're usually trying to find things that aren't easy to find mm -hmm. so we wouldn't tend to act as a buying agent for somebody who's typical property that they would buy would be on St Mary's Park in Hartley or Elvertham Heath mm -hmm. where there is and they are perfectly good locations for a lot of people but there are a lot of them so if you couldn't buy that four bedroom detached on Elvertham mm -hmm. one week there will be another not too far away but if you're looking for something a little bit more uh, interesting a little bit more different uh, maybe something not necessarily just of a higher value but something that's a bit more quirky. unique quirky uh, maybe something that's you know a period property maybe got more land more garaging carriage driveway something that makes it distinct when there's less of them that's when you need the buying agent more often so you just need so it is a responsibility you don't want to waste people's time but if you do it right the worst thing that can happen from them viewing a property they don't buy is you learn more about the, the ones that they think they'd want to buy or indeed the ones that you ought to then find for them. So the other question is, how do you get to know your client? Because KYC is very important in the industry. And there are a lot of clients that you know, would come to you and go, well, just, just buy, you know, look for this property. I want to buy it. I've got, um, you know, three months I need to move. And it's not always easy if you can't actually get to know your clients a little bit better, understand hobbies, um, get, get to understand the way they think when it comes to a, a buyer, so to speak. You know, where are they at emotionally, perhaps? Mm. Aren't there those things to consider, too? Because you would, you would think, I mean, I would think that if I was dealing with a client who wants to buy something ASAP, what are the reasons for them wanting to buy the property? But on top of that, where are they at in their lives? Yeah, so it's it's similar to the, the amount of time we put in as a consultation with a vendor. So with a vendor, you'd obviously spend a fair amount of time winning the business, getting them to the point where they say, Adrian, Candice, we want you to sell our house. We then spend that quite a lot of time doing the pre, you know the presentation, the staging, the yep, essential repairs, yep. the marketing, the photos. 
So that's probably in total, that's probably, you know, seven or eight hours worth of work of, you know, preparing mm. for, for meeting them, meeting them, winning the business and then preparing the house for sale. It's the same with the buying agent role. So somebody likes the idea of it and you and they say, yes, I'm going to retain you to act as buying agent. You then have a really, really long consultation with them and really dig deep on what it is they're looking for. Mm. So we gave that simple example of four bedroom detached house in fleet for one and a half million with a quarter of an acre. But we would also really dig deep and say, well, why do you want quarter of an acre? Why do you want fleet? Why do you want four bedrooms? All of the things we ask about, we query, is three enough? Do you actually need five? Do you need a quarter of an acre? Or you actually do you need more? Do you need less? It's a real dig deep on why do you need that? Because the purchase will always be a compromise. So you've got to work out where the real hard lines in the sand are and where the compromises are. Because otherwise, n- nobody would ever buy anything. Well, well, that's important. And I think a lot of uh, people out there will, will say, well, why do I have to compromise? And we, we understand why. There's some, there's some small compromises you may have to make. But for you, being a buying agent and, and the work that we do, we don't necessarily want clients to compromise because it's a very personal thing. It's a big deal having to go out there and actually go, right, we found the right property, I'm buying it. I think I'll share one of my experiences with you and I'll keep it short. Uh, One of my London clients who has two lovely apartments in central London said, I want you to go out there and find me a lovely bolt hole in the country. Um, I don't know where I want to be exactly. Don't worry worry about the polo ponies. They've been taken care of wherever they are. Um, It's just a bolt hole during the summer and holidays where I can go with my wife and my children and they can spend more time um, you, you know, away during half term when I can't join them. But here's the thing. I don't want to drive more than two hours out of London. I then had to dig a little bit deeper and I found out that he actually had a property in the Cotswolds. So on a Monday morning, he would have to wake up at four o'clock in the morning to get back into London for eight. And that was very tough for him. And he sold the most beautiful property I've ever seen right? But it didn't matter how many properties I sent him in different villages, which is picturesque and and well known for their charm. He just couldn't decide on which village would suit them best. What do you do then? What would you recommend? There comes a point where that two hour radius then has to not be just a a simple circle, but you know, do you want to go north, south, east or west? Mm. How are you going to drive? Are you going to drive into work or are you going to get the train? You could get a train in from somewhere like Lincolnshire, which, let's be honest, sounds like it's a million mm. miles away. It does, doesn't but it? But Lincolnshire trains, you get into King's Cross in about 90 minutes. So, you know, you, that's when you need to dig deeper. Why is it two hours? How are you getting in? Uh, would you ever, oh, I'd never get on a train in the month of Sundays. I've got a great compromise tell um, me, example. Tell me, tell Did me. I ever tell you about an old boss and his three properties and his compromise? No, but I'm about to hear it. You are. I'm good, good job you didn't say yes, because then I wouldn't have been able to tell you. <laughs> old boss, multimillionaire. Uh, he had three properties that we knew of. One of them was in the Boltons in Knightsbridge. Uh, one of them was a beautiful 15-bedroom manor house in Newbury. Uh, Bottle and Berkshire, Newbury, uh, outskirts. The other one was a villa in the south of France. Out one evening for a meal with him, he was, we were talking about compromise, don't know how, he reeled off like that five things about all three properties that were a compromise. That's a multimillionaire with a house worth over 30 million, another mansion worth about 10. And a, he immediately said they were compromises. I'm they intrigued. were a millionaire's first world problems. His one in the Boltons was he couldn't get, a t- he couldn't get planning for a turntable driveway. Oh. You know, for him, big problem. He couldn't get planning for a helipad at Newbury because we were based in Chelsea and he wanted clients to be able to fly from Chelsea and Battersea, Mm -hmm. where the offices were Mm -hmm. and where clients were from Battersea Helipad, to Newbury. He couldn't get planning for that. So they were very much his problems, but they were were still compromises Mm -hmm. on why he bought those and why he would have bought something else if he could. So no matter how much money you've got, there will always be a compromise on that purchase, mm-hmm. even if to us it would like be don't be daft because you'd see that house and think I'd dream of living there. But for him, a bit of an issue. Hmm. Well, Adrian, I'm going to leave it there today. I just want to thank you for your time today. Yeah, thank you. And 
I, I do I work with Adrian, but I must say I've seen him in that active role as the buying agent, and he does one hell of a job. So keep doing what you're doing. There, there's a lot of people out there depending on on you to to do what you promise be to, for, to deliver. It's going to be a big thing for both of us next year. I think. I know. I know. Gosh, I think we'll be having a different conversation next year. Wonder what what that all will be about. I don't know, but do you want to do? Can you host another of these again? Because I quite enjoyed sort of chatting away to you rather than me sitting. Did you? It. Yeah. So. I was a little bit worried there no. for a minute. There we go. Ah, oh, well, always lovely. Well, thank you very, very much. No, thank you. Till next time. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Dee Shepherd from SMJ Media Group. If you like what we do, and if you enjoyed what you heard today, then please do continue to support us. Support us in our conversations, in our events, in our communication, and how we publish and how we promote all local businesses. So, how do you do that? Well, you can buy me a coffee. Where? Buymeacoffee.com forward slash SMJ Media Group.